Well, welcome to the John Pender Living History of Anesthesiology series. The program of the Wood Library Museum of Anesthesiology in Park Ridge, Illinois, celebrates the lives of those who have made outstanding achievements in the medical specialty and the practice of anesthesiology. I'm your host, David Brown, Dave Brown, who am professor and chair of the Anesthesiology Institute at the Cleveland Clinic Lerner College of Medicine. Today, we're going to be interviewing Dr. Kevin Tremper, who is professor and chair of the Department of Anesthesiology at the University of Michigan. Kevin, welcome. Thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you for this opportunity. Well, we uh, are going to start off back in your early years. Where were you born? And tell us about those early years growing up. I was uh, born in Springfield, Pennsylvania, uh, southeastern Pennsylvania, about 40 miles west of Philadelphia, in the sort of the, in the 50s. Born in 48. Um, second of four children. Uh, my father was a uh, actually ex test pilot for helicopters that went into uh, marketing of helicopters uh, pretty much around the world. Had an office in uh, London, Philadelphia, and uh, in Canada. Uh, my mom was a homemaker. Um, she finished college and had some children. Mm -hmm. and, um, had a great, great childhood. Good. Good. Um, should I continue on? Well, or tell me about you. You had some experience flying a Cub. Yeah. Tell me about that. <clears throat> well, I um, as, as a kid, this was a great time to be a kid. I think fifties and sixties. I mean, the, uh, um, we built little cars in our neighborhood made out of wood with uh, Briggs and Stratton lawnmower engines. <laughs> so we we're driving those all over the place. Um, and the in the sixties came out with um, you know James Bond. The Beatles, you know, all kinds of uh, fun things that time. Um, my father, though, when I turned 16, he uh, said, well, 16, it's time to learn to fly. Um, I said, how about drive? Said, oh, you can do that anytime." Uh, so he took me out to uh, Downingtown Airport. It's a grass strip uh, west of Philadelphia. And uh, J3 Cub, you're familiar with that. Dave's a big time flyer. Um, uh, for those who aren't familiar with the J3, it's canvas covered, uh, 65 horsepower, hand starting. Um, Top speed in still air is about 85 miles an hour. Uh, top speed in a dive is about 125, and there's a big red line at 125. Um, no radio. Um, visual flight rules or IFR as I follow roads. Right? Yeah. I mean, so right. it was it was a lot of fun. It was, it was great, uh, great little plane to fly, um, and uh, it got me interested in in um, sort of engineering actually and, and technology. So right off the bat. What else did you do as a kid to spend time? I was, uh, my parents uh, actually bought an old barn and converted it into a house. And uh, they had a sw swimming pool, which was pretty unique back then. Um, so I swam a lot as a, as a kid up through uh, about high school. But junior high, beginning of high school, my father uh, took me to a ski hill. Uh, he'd been on the, uh, grew up in Seattle. He was on the uh, charter member of the National Ski Patrol. He was a big skier, Hunter Fisher, and he got us skiing, my brothers and I, and family, and uh, so I was basically an all-out skier from the first day I went down the first hill and crashed at the bottom. I was uh, I spent all summer saving money to go skiing and all winters going up to New England. Um, broke both legs in uh, skiing in New England during high school and uh, basically looked on for skiing as my major occupation. Um, in school, I may have been dyslexic. I knew I was horrible at reading and actually extraordinarily bad at spelling. I actually actually got the worst spelling grade in my entire high school on a test. So I wasn't wasn't the second the worst. I was the worst, um, but loved math. So um, math was the what I enjoyed and, and what I had ended up going on in college. Well, tell me, you you shared with me earlier some of your academic pursuit to go to your undergraduate degree was based as much on skiing yeah. as it was on an undergraduate well, I, um, degree. I really w was looking for schools that had skiing nearby. I looked for some in New England, and uh, for people that know New England, most of the schools up in New England are, are probably mostly liberal arts schools where you actually have to be able to read, write, and spell. <laughs> um, and I was out skiing actually on a, on a break at um, 
at Vail. Um, turns out I was going to go over New England, it started to rain, went down to Kennedy, went out to Vail um, without my parents actually knowing. Um, was out there for a week, but I didn't have any money. Um, just enough to get out there. So I actually uh, was sleeping in a laundromat um, and during the day trying to meet people that might have a place to live. Uh, bumped into a guy that had a, uh, had a condo that his parents had. And um, he said, I'd stay with him. And then uh, he, ended up, he and his buddies were going to the University of Denver. So I said, ski bum, Denver, that sounds like where I should be. So I ended up applying to the University of Denver and ended up going there as a math major. Um, well, I actually was a ski major, math minor. Um, <laughs> I ended up getting a scholarship, which shocked me. I was surprised. Um, then I went on to, um, I tried to make the Denver ski team, which they had a, they had a super team. Their, their coach was the Olympic coach. I think the Denver ski team is, has the record for the most national championships of any sport. There aren't that many ski teams around. So right. Denver had sort of a lock on that, that in Colorado. Um, I uh, couldn't make the ski team, but they had a ski school that anybody that didn't make the team, they'd point you toward the ski school. So I taught uh, on weekends at Arapahoe Basin, uh, A Basin, right on the top of the Continental Divide, uh, fun area. So I worked there every weekend and then studied math. So you really did major in ski? I made, oh, no, definitely, I was a ski major. But I started out as a math major. I actually um, asked uh, one of the counselors, I said, I, I like math, but, but what do they do? And they said, well, uh, pretty much wait on t tables, drive taxis. <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, who gets jobs? And they said, uh, last year it was accountants and chemical engineers. And I said, what's a chemical engineer? <laughs> so uh, he said, oh, that's applied chemistry and physics math. So I, I then switched to chemical engineering and finished up at Denver as a chemical engineer. So you finished at the University of Denver mm -hmm. in chemical engineering and then went off to the left coast. Yeah, the left coast, right. So I, um, I had a great class of chemical engineers. There were four of us. So it was a huge class of four. Um, we had four faculty, and you couldn't hide. Uh, but Denver's chemical engineering was, it was very small. Um, and I wanted to go on and get a, um, uh, at least a master's degree at a place that had a larger program. Uh, I'd been a minor in business, actually, at Denver. So a minor business major in chemical engineering. Uh, I started interviewing around, and I went out to Berkeley. And I don't know if you've been to Berkeley in the late '60s, early '70s. Was was uh, you know very entertaining. I mean, there was uh, uh, I don't know anybody that's been to the campus. It's a beautiful campus. It's just sort of uh, in a city, but it's uh, gardens everywhere, just beautiful buildings, and then all kinds of activity. Um, so I fell in love with it instantaneously and uh, applied there for graduate school. Fortunately, was accepted to the master's program, um, and then stayed on. So you got your master's in chemical engineering? Yeah, in, uh, in catalysis, uh, studying the uh, 111 crystal plane of iridium in an ultra-high vacuum piece of equipment, uh, like uh, 10 to the 7 minus 17 atmospheres. It was, it was a pure physics experiment in a basement, in a room, painted black, looking into a scope that I, you know, it was, it was, I felt like a mole. So uh, that lasted 18 months and uh, I had to come up for air and sun every once in a while. So I said, I, I definitely can't do this forever. Well, at uh, that time, you also had a draft number. Oh yeah, right. So tell, um, tell us about that. Yeah, I was finishing at Denver and um, uh, for those of you back then, they, they uh, had deferments for, actually chemical engineers got deferments because they made gasoline and military runs on gas. Uh, they ended deferments and had the draft numbers, and uh, my number was 101. Uh, Philadelphia Draft Board called me, took my physical, passed, and was told, uh, don't make any plans for you know, June. Uh, I was accepted at Denver, at uh, UC Berkeley for uh, graduate school, and, and I was thinking, wow, I, I guess I won't be able to do that. Then a friend from actually Berkeley, one of the other graduate students, uh, contacted me and said, you can join the National Guard um, and that's what he had done. And if you join the National Guard, for, you sign up for six years, you uh, get a deferment. So I signed up in um, the spring um, at Denver um, and was sent to uh, Fort Polk, Louisiana for the summer. Great summer place. Um, quite, a, 
quite a, I think that it was supposed to be condemned after World War II, but they spiffed it up during Korean and repainted it for Vietnam War. Um, uh, yeah, it was quite an experience. I really came out of that with a tremendous respect for the military. Absolute phenomenal. What they did with young kids coming in and what they came out with was just incredible. Um, so anyway, I was a National Guard. Now, when I was in the middle of basic training, the uh, Nixon ended the draft. So I'd signed up for six years, and if I'd gone for another three weeks, I, I probably would have been out of it. But um, So I transferred to the uh, Fort Cronkite, which is in uh, Sausalito, California, just across the Golden Gate Bridge. It's one of those tough duty spots. Tough duties. If you, if you go across the bridge and you bear off to the right towards Sausalito, the first is a road to the left that goes through a one-way tunnel that comes out on this beautiful countryside right along the beach. It's where they, all, where they film all those car ads of uh, cars sitting up on a hill looking down at the Golden Gate. Um, that's where, the, where, our, uh, where we met on uh, every weekend, one weekend a month. Um, I was supposed to be the, uh, I was supposed to be the instructor for Jeep tune-ups for the fuel electrical system. So I was a Jeep tune-up instructor specialist. Um, but we didn't have any Jeeps and we didn't have any students. <laughs> so we just went over there and met on weekends, uh, waiting to be called to uh, whatever. You shared with me before a little story. Berkeley was known for having a lot of long hairs. Yeah. But you, you, you were creative. Yeah, Tell my, us my hair, believe it or not, was longer than, than it is now. Um, and uh, along with the other one, other uh, some of the other people in the Guard that were also graduate students there, if you had hair of the length that the military was happy with, you looked a little um, out of place at Berkeley at the time. So everybody in the group had wigs that they put, got bought wigs, went to the barber, had them cut as short hair wigs, and would wear short hair <laughs> wigs, uh, otherwise so you could pass inspection and then go back. So um, that was my, now I wish I had that wig. I lost a lot more hair than I have right now. So. <laughs> well, you, you shared with me that when you weren't wearing the wig, and you then went on after your master's for Ph.D. at Berkeley. Yeah. Um, and that leads that's into leads meeting to, John Severinghouse. Yeah. So I, um, I, um, there, was a, there was a professor at Berkeley in the chemical engineering named um, John Prausnitz. And he was a uh, classic German scientist, very precise, very, very productive. He had 18 Ph.D. students, uh, triple the normal and a very, very productive program. And if you signed up for one of his projects, um, you would graduate. I mean, you would get work done. He uh, was very structured. So I switched from this basic physics project for masters to a, a straightforward project of um, measuring solubility of gases and liquids, Henry's Law. And uh, there was a theoretical component where you had to do some analysis of molecular thermodynamic analysis equations to predict solubility and then measure solubility of gases and liquids. So that, um, that was the project. Now, um, make a long story longer. Uh, because the projects were selected, pre-selected for you if you wanted to get paid, these were funded research projects, uh, they felt to be a PhD student, you had to make up your own project. You had to find a, an idea to do research on that had nothing to do with what you were actually currently doing to prove you could come up with your own project. So I went uh, from the top of the part of the hill on Berkeley down from the chemistry school down to the biology and I sat in the library for probably six months looking at different projects that I might do related to biology because I had sort of an interest in that. And I found an uh, um, uh, analysis of uh, tissue perfusion using uh, xenon and uh, it's radioactive xenon. And the analysis of that seemed to be um, trying to break the laws of physics for some reason. It, it, it had ignored just standard mathematics diffusion equations. So I, um, as my project, I chose to do a, a mathematical analysis of tissue perfusion in cylindrical coordinates of simultaneous chemical reaction and diffusion, which um, was, was linked uh, partial differential equations, and it was um, that analysis. Uh, it was so much fun to actually take something straight out of the engineering textbook and put it into a biological system. Um, uh, I, I started thinking maybe that would be more interesting than, than making gasoline. Uh, in addition, I, I, um, my professor Prausnitz picked a, another professor 
uh, for my PhD because you need three advisors. And one, this was named Irv Fat, and he was a, a mechanical engineer, really a bioengineer. He developed the soft contact lens for Bosch and Lohm. He d developed all the oxygen transport to the cornea. Original lenses were glass. You put them on, you had to take them out, otherwise your cornea would die of lack of oxygen. So he developed the, the oxygen. He was sort of an oxygen transport to the eye expert. And he used electrochemical sensors to do that. And his, his, um, he said there was a, a buddy of mine that I collaborate with who's, an, who's a doctor of some sort, um, works in San Francisco. And he's been measuring uh, electrochemical sensors for years. Uh, his name is John Severinghouse. And he uh, has a machine that actually measures O2, CO2, pH that he... And uh, so he and Irfat had been collaborators. And he introduced me to the concept of a doctor doing this type of work. In fact, it was Dr. Fat that said, um, if you like the things that, like this, like John Severinghouse is doing, you really need to go to medical school instead of a postdoc because you really, uh, otherwise you won't get the opportunity to apply them to actual people, which was his experience. He developed a sarcontact contact lens, but he never actually got to put it in people to see how it worked. He was always handing it off to some other person. Um, so that was really the impetus to go there. And again, to make the story a little longer, he, he was also a collaborator on a research NIH grant at University of California, Irvine, where they were developing skin surface sensors to measure oxygen and carbon dioxide for preterm infants, uh, transcutaneous oxygen sensors. And he was the, um, their um, theoretical um, engineering advisor for this project because he'd done so much work on this. And he said, well, if you go there, you could possibly work with him. So that's how I ended up going into medicine, was, was hearing about John Severing. I actually hadn't met him at the time. Um, so you made your decision to go to medical school before you met John? Yes. I made it because uh, Dr. Fat said, look, you know, go to medical school and you'll be able to apply what you do from inception to application. And otherwise, you'll get to inception to approaching application and you'll hand it over to someone and you'll never really get the, the, the uh, complete story. So that, that was the choice to go. So you finished your PhD at Berkeley? On Friday. How'd you get to medical school? I drove down, uh, had to go to school on Monday. Um, I had a, Irvine then had a different uh, schedule. Uh, medical school started in June. And you did anatomy, four hours a day, biochemistry four hours a day, and by September you'd finished all anatomy and biochemistry. Most medical schools started in September. When I applied, I had scheduled, I was on a pretty tight schedule to finish my PhD. And it turned out that uh, when I got accepted at Irvine with a scholarship, which was great, I was very grateful for that, including living expense, which is even better, um, I had to get there June 1st. And I hadn't finished. So I worked right up till the Friday afternoon, handed in a thesis, and left down south. I did not complete my foreign language requirement because I was horrible at foreign languages, and I was hoping they would stop that. But they didn't. And I hadn't presented my thesis. And so I had to uh, uh, sign a paper. I would come back within six months, within a year. If I didn't complete those within a year, they would remove my, me from the rules and I'd lose my PhD. Um, so I went down to Irvine and I came back during the Christmas break and squeaked through a French exam which was translating an abstract and presented my thesis. And I think they were very lenient on me in both of those to let me get my PhD. So actually my PhD wasn't until 76. Um, uh, that's how I ended up at Irvine. So medical school at Irvine. Mm -hmm. You had a link to Bruce Cullen. Yeah, Bruce Cullen, Stuart Cullen's son, Stuart who started UCSF. Bruce uh, started the department at UC Irvine. Irvine was one of three new medical schools the University of California started. Um, they bought the county hospitals in San Diego, Orange, and St. Uh, Davis, and uh, Sacramento, and uh, started a medical school. Bruce was the founder of the department, as many departments. There weren't really were no academic departments. They were, it was a brand new school. Uh, so he was a young, super enthusiastic guy, and I met him uh, at indirect talk, and I think in our first year, or second year of medical school, about anesthesia. Now, I'd already heard about anesthesia, and I actually had decided to go into it, 
because of hearing about John Severinghouse, but I actually didn't know what they did for a living, actually. Um, I knew the research aspect. Bruce Cullen gave a, a great introductory talk, and it's made me even more excited. It was, it was really applied physiology was what I was being sold, and you know, what it actually is. Um, so Bruce was there, and um, he was sort of a mentor to uh, guide me to continue that, in that direction. Um, I ended up, the, back in the, then, they, Irvine had a three-year, possible three-year early graduation. Um, and uh, me being a little older, um, I went after my first year, and, and I took my national boards in medical school after one year. I hadn't had uh, pharmacology. So I, I actually totally flunked the pharmacology part. But you only had to pass, I think, four of the five sections and have an average passing score. So I think I probably have the worst board scores that anybody <laughs> can imagine because I flunked one and I squeaked by the others. But I, pat I did after one year. And I wanted to pass early because I was hoping to apply for early graduation because of my age. Um, so I, um, I went to the advisor and said, could I consider how do I apply for that? And he said, that was for good students. And um, I said, well, I'm, I'm planning to get better. Uh, but uh, I ended up uh, getting a three-year graduation um, by doing a couple other things and, and uh, convincing them that it was uh, appropriate for me to leave early. Um, but anesthesia was, was my choice from the beginning, but I, I started um, enjoying our, our uh, critical care. I had one elective in medical school um, that I was able to do, and I chose to do it in critical care and had been advised to go work with, at a unit at Hollywood Presbyterian Hospital in LA, run by a critical care guy named Max Harry Weil. And I went up there, and I was the only student, and there was a fellow, Gene Lewis Vincent was the fellow, visiting uh, Max Harry Weil's unit. And it was phenomenal. It was, it was 10 beds. Uh, it looked like uh, they had monitored to the max. Everyone had a thermistor on their big toe, because you measure big toe temperature as the earliest predictor of going south, and really got excited about critical care. And um, at the end of the month, I met with Dr. Weil and told him my interest, and he said, well, you know, if you really like this, you need to do an internship. You should go to Harbor General Hospital, the county hospital on the west side of LA, because there's a surgeon over there who's loves critical care, and he, you can work with him. His name was Will Shoemaker. And um, we called Harbor General, we called it the Harvard of Torrance. Um, so went over to uh, there and was a surgery intern uh, at this county hospital. It's a great place to work. Um, tremendous opportunity for responsibility at an early age, you know. Uh, um, and worked with him as an intern. I was in the unit because I was a surgery intern. I was in there probably half the time. And because of my interest in oxygen monitoring that I'd gotten, through um, work initially down at UC Irvine and with Dr. Fatt at Berkeley, uh, started doing non-invasive oxygen monitoring work um, on animals uh, um, and in the ICU, uh, starting as an intern. Well, Kevin, you did your internship in Western Los Angeles. How did you get to UCLA for residency. At the end of the inter uh, internship, I asked, uh, well, Dr. Shoemaker offered me an a ICU fellowship. So I went from internship to ICU fellowship. So I stayed at Harvard General for a year, and then I signed up for another six months um, and because I was having you know, a great time. Uh, we're, I was doing the auction monitoring work I was doing. He was doing large outcomes database work, believe it or not, centuries ahead of his time, collecting data on all these ICU patients. Um, got involved in a blood substitute study, which is a whole other story. Um, he actually said after the, uh, I'd been there two and a half years, he said, you need to go to residency. You can't avoid this forever. You know, you got to get, get your specialty. I'd actually been, apply was accepted to Mass General and was planning to go back there. And Dr. Kitts, the way they added people every two months, when I contacted him, I said, can I put it off for a year? He said, fine. I said, can I put it off for another six months? He said, fine, just tell us, and you can add in the next two-month cycle, as they used to do it. And finally, I, I just said, I, don't, I think I'll just stay out here. I had a house on the beach. So uh, I said, well, how about UCLA? And, and Severing, I mean, uh, Shoemaker said, sure, go up there. So I met Ron Katz, and he said, sure, got a job. When would you like to start? 
So I started January uh, 81, class of two of us in January, and um, got excellent clinical training, went through the, the uh, regular rotations. So you finish at UCLA mm -hmm. in residency. What was your next step? I had kept in contact with uh, Bruce, K I should say Patricia Kapoor was my teacher there. She was on the faculty, I think it was her first or second year, and she was head of the VA and taught me how to put central lines in. Um, uh, so I had contacted Bruce, he'd contacted me, and he offered me a position at Irvine on the faculty um, with 50% um, research time, uh, 2,000 square feet of lab space. Um, I had some startup funds, I had a, had a small grant, and uh, I couldn't think of anything else I wanted. I, I talked to Ron Cass and I said, well, what else should I ask for? And he said something interesting. He said, ask Bruce how long he's going to be there. I said, really? So I talked to Bruce. He said, oh, I'm happy here. I like it here. Went to Irvine, and, and one year later, Bruce went to Seattle. And um, I think uh, I think he, he uh, I think he was tired of the recruitment, continuous recruitment that was required in Southern California at that time. I think the so average. So you're a year on faculty. A year on at faculty. Irvine. When he left. When he left. Next step was next step. Now, next step was a little interesting because um, when he was going to lead, the dean met with the department and said, "We need you." He preferred that the faculty selected an acting chair, or he would select one. The person that said they would wanted to be acting chair was was the clinical director. Um, I, I I loved Irvine. I loved everybody, except for the clinical director. <laughs> he didn't think academic time was work. He said, you only work half time. I said, well, actually, I'm doing, no, you're only working half time. So I had this special deal, which the clinical directors don't like special deals. So of the, all the department, that's the person that really would not be great for me to be acting chair. So I was contacting other places to leave. And some of the younger faculty said, why don't you be acting chair? We're kind of afraid of this guy also. You know, we, with him running things. So um, there was a vote. I won by one vote, and I voted for myself. <laughs> or I wouldn't have been chair. Um, I made this other gentleman. The we ran the Long Beach VA. I made him head of the VA, so he was 12 miles away, and um, he ended up going to private practice after that. And, and I became chair. So I was uh, not board certified. Hadn't taken my boards yet, uh, which is another story. I don't want to go too far off, but I, I was scheduled for my boards and. It conflicted with a fishing trip. And I wrote a letter to the boards that said, I can't take it, i got to go fishing. Um, How was that received? Believe it or not, they said, that's fine. And I, you know, I said, if you have to count it as a flunk, that's fine, but I really don't want to miss this trip. So how did you get your time from Irvine and then transition to the University of Michigan? Well, I, um, uh, another character in this story that I met when I was at Irvine was a, was a young, hotshot trauma surgeon intensivist named Bob Bartlett. He was sort of a, 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 almost a larger-than-life figure at Irvine. He had invented the incentive spirometer. He was making ECMO out in the animal labs. And um, I sort of met him. And he, when I went through Harbor and UCLA, when I came back to Irvine, he'd left. He'd gone back to where he originally trained, was at the University of Michigan. Um, so ironically, a year and a half after I became chair, I got a letter to see if I would apply for chair at Michigan. And I said, I'm flattered, but I haven't passed my boards yet. I never heard from them after that. <laughs> so I uh, went along and uh, grew the department at Irvine. Um, we're doing fine. They uh, recruiting people. It didn't bother me to be recruiting more people. I just, you know, would hire a faculty a month. Anybody that came unexpected to my office with a tie on, I assumed they were leaving. And um, <laughs> so then, five years later, after that, um, I got married to a um, OB resident at Irvine, set up as a blind date by one of our residents. Um, fortunately, it worked out. I probably would have been arrested by the, the dean or something, and had, a, had a, a son. And then I got a letter again, as I said, from Michigan and from other place about uh, what I considered chair. And at this point, I thought maybe it was a time to leave California. 
Um, I didn't know if I wanted that to be where a family grow a family. I was used to the East Coast seasons, trees, leaves, things like that. Um, so I ended up going back to Michigan, oh. and um, it was a great opportunity. Uh, so you started at Michigan when? Uh, January 1st, 1991. I went there in the summer of 90, the fall of 90, um, and sort of put out a list of things that would be required, I thought, to grow the department. Uh, they'd been through a uh, failed search acting chair, chair that had a medic had to take a medical leave and another acting chair. So they'd gone through a period without really a chair. Uh, so they were very anxious to get somebody to take the job and uh, were very, very supportive. So virtually everything I wrote on the list, they said, sounds good. So I'd add something else. They said, sounds good. Um, so how did you grow the department at Michigan from that instability yeah. to well, what's now would, one of the fine departments? Yeah, I think that um, when I got there, uh, one of the things I put on the list, at the bottom list, was I, I would like funding to buy, build, or develop a perioperative information system for clinical care, teaching, and research. And I sold the clinical director, the, the hospital director at that time, the importance of uh, an information system for the OR. Um, and he signed, uh, put money in an account so we'd be able to do that in, in 1990. So I had that money independent to do this, to do a project in the future. Uh, when I got there, I thought it was a very strong clinical department, but it had not developed uh, subspecialty groups. Um, some they had a very strong peds group, but the other groups had not really developed the way they could. Um, Irvine was relatively small, number of ORs, eight ORs. Uh, the main OR at Michigan was about, uh, I think, 22 when I got there, so it was huge. You know, now we got 75, but it was huge from what I was used to, and there was so much um, strength and, and diversity in the surgical caseload, I was just incredibly impressed. And I thought with this type of caseload, you know, two to three to four rooms of every specialty, uh, it would be it was perfect for developing a, a strong residency program and strong subspecialties. So that's what the work was: develop subspecialties. Well, you you've been at Michigan twenty plus years now. Yeah, twenty twenty one years. Twenty one years. What do you attribute your long tenure? Because that's a long tenure for a chair. Yeah. And the follow on question. Yeah. What's your proudest accomplishment? Yeah. Well, I would consider my long tenure as a chair to uh, Jenny Mace, my secretary. She, when I got to Irvine, she was my secretary. It was my first day at work. It was her first day at work. We've been together ever since. Um, so she left Irvine with she you? She left Irvine. She and her family moved to Michigan. Every manuscript I've written, every talk, all the best jokes um, have been hers. Great sense of humor. She can spell, I can't. We're a perfect match. And so um, she's been uh, the person, my, my main um, collaborator, career collaborator, and has, and has you know, uh, kept me out of trouble and, uh, and made it so people could read what I, what I wrote. Um, in Michigan, there, there's uh, the, the benefit of Michigan versus Southern California. Ann Arbor is a beautiful town, great football stadium, People go there, they don't come and go so much. In Southern California, if you wanted to quit jobs, you just drove left instead of right into a different parking lot and you were you had a job, right? There are there are hospitals, there are three hundred hospitals in LA. So you could go anywhere in a heartbeat. Mm -hmm. Irvine was different. People at Michigan basically moved there, wanted to stay there. I mean they, there are people that there was some turnover, but mostly people went there because they wanted to live at Ann Arbor, they wanted to be at the University of Michigan. So uh, I wouldn't say they were more loyal, but it was by, by logistics and by from being there to begin with, they, they were there to stay. I think it's like Mayo Clinic, where, where you were, were for some time. Um, so that really helped, because you could grow uh, so specialties, you could grow faculty, you could invest in their careers, and they would most likely be there to have it pay off. So let's go back to that question about your proudest accomplishment at Michigan looking back well, on those 21 years? 
in my overall career, I'd say the 80s was uh, helping in the development, testing, and promotion of non-invasive monitoring. And, in, and I got, when I got into the 90s, I, I felt that the, the biggest breakthroughs had been done. Um, my old professor would say, if you're gonna do something, don't sharpen needles for a career. <laughs> if, they, if the big impact's been made, move on to something else. And then uh, developing an information system uh, for the, the purposes of, of uh, clinical care education and outcomes research. So starting in the early mid-90s, developing an information system was, uh, was a fun job. Uh, Michael Riley, who's now Vice President of Massimo, but he was, a, he was the head of the project. So developing the subspecialties in Michigan to now where I think we have a very, very strong clinical and academic subspecialties across the board with fellowships. We had, uh, what, 54 residents. We have 114 now. We had uh, one or zero fellows. We had like 28 fellows. And all that's because of the growth of the subspecialty faculty and their skills and academic talent. Uh, the information system has been sort of a framework from which to develop clinical research. It's a, it's a tool uh, that, that helps in the expansion of that. And then um, development of MPOG, I've got to put a pitch in for that, the Moly Centered Perioperative Outcomes Group, which uh, we developed there with the brainchild is, is Sachin Katerpal, who was the, uh, one of the programmer, MD programmers uh, with the, uh, uh, with the, when we built the information system, we called it More Care. Uh, with a company called SEC. He was an MD programmer with his brother. We contracted with them to build this perioperative system. They ultimately sold it to GE, and I ultimately recruited Sachin back to residency, and, uh, and now he's the leader of MPOG. And so in addition to your Michigan work, mm -hmm. you've done a lot of national work. Mm -hmm. What has been your fondest accomplishment nationally? Uh, well, I, the um, what was used to be called the SAC APD, being uh, the, an officer there and, and a president for the term there, was has been was fun. Um, uh, S Simon Gilman was sort of my mentor for that. He was the president before me and got me onto the council, and and um, that was rewarding. It's now called the SAAA, and it's a larger organization. Uh, of course, being a board examiner. With you and others has been been great fun. I had my last. I got my spoon, so I my my last my knock on the door uh, a month ago. Um, and then uh, uh, AUA involvement uh, as a, you know officer and uh, uh, president of that has been also. Well, through those years, you had mm -hmm. all your national work. Mm -hmm. You developed some friends across the specialty. Yeah. Tell us about some of those. Well, I, I developed lifelong friendships with the leadership group at Michigan um, and for the group of faculty there. Um, I get rattle off a pile of names there, Ted Sanford and Tim Rutter and uh, Nora Naughton, uh, you know, many others. And, and uh, on the academic side, uh, George Mishore, Chad Brummett, and Chris Ramachandra, Picton and Healy and well, you know, you'll get in yeah. trouble for this yeah. because <laughs> yeah, yeah, you listed right, all yeah, your yeah, faculty. Right, right, right. Got listed right. Okay. And the others I didn't list. Pardon me. Shoma. Um, uh, Linda Polly to put that in. Joe yeah. Meyer. Um, around the country, it's been just a group of great people. I, I think that, um, well, you, uh, David, has been a friend for 20 years. Right. Um, uh, Basically, from east to west, I'm trying to. It's it's almost um, a list of all the current chairs. I mean, uh, well, you've been a you've been, pleasure, you know. yeah, you've been a member of the Morton Society. Yeah, and that's that's a, a great group. I guess it's what the least best secret known as a group, but that has been a uh, tremendous being a, a president of that, which is something sort of passed around. It was fun, and it's a it's a great group for bouncing off ideas. Uh, it's a tremendous way to learn things from other departments. I I've always thought that uh, stealing is the best compliment. <laughs> and anything anybody's got a good idea, definitely steal it. Uh, I've also had the motto. Uh, Will Shoemaker told me a long time ago: "Your 
your friends come and go, but your enemies accumulate. So we watch. <laughs> so I tried to, I tried to make make friends, okay. and uh, I think you've had a, a tremendous uh, group around the country. Good. Well, what as you look to the future, what do you think our specialty needs to do to continue to thrive? Yeah, that is that is a tough one. Um, I think as medicine, how's medicine going to thrive? Is is a is a huge question, and what our role is it in medicine. I think we we sort of put the, the first flag on the ground for safety. And I think it's time for us to replant a safety flag. Uh, just like aviation that you and I have been involved with made great strides and, and they still don't give up, but their their crash rate of, for commercial aircraft now is one in 25 million. Uh, we have a long way to go. And in, in addition to improving safety intra-op and immediately peri-op, is we can be the leaders in, in safety and medicine in general. Uh, we see it from a broader perspective. Uh, we've got a, uh, the skills to, uh, to problem solve. So I think we need to take a broader role, not only in the management of patients perioperatively, but in safety in general. And I know that you know five or six years ago when, when we were told, uh, uh, make sure those antibiotics are in on time, we'd say, well, what the heck, they don't, they don't produce analgesia, amnesia, or paralysis. Why are we have to? Well, we do, you know, because we're the ones best suited to do it. We can get it done right. We, we should probably know what the right antibiotic is, you know, just like we know the right muscle relaxer. So getting involved in helping the hospitals become safer and more effective uh, is, is our role, because we live there, you know. How are we going to add value? Short of just putting antibiotics in on time, how do yeah. we add value into these institutions? Well, there, the good news is that there's huge problems. Um, people think the Institute of Medicine's estimate of 100,000 people a year killed in hospitals is probably a way underestimate, and the numbers injured and problems are greater. So it isn't as though there aren't enough problems. And, and usually to find a good project is to find a problem. So the, the problems in, from when some person actually has a complaint to when they actually go home and are happy, there's, there's huge problems along the way in, in quality um, in preventing uh, uh, problems in miscommunication, uh, transfer of care communication. I think we, we need to be best at that. Like, I mean, you're, you're a pilot more than I am, but if you hand over from the one pilot to the co-pilot, take over the plane, there's a very structured way of doing it, prevents planes from crashing. Uh, although we're starting to do structured handoffs, but all the way along, we don't transmit for information well. We don't communicate well. Uh, so we should be the, as a role in, in leaders in safety, in medicine in general, we should use our, our skills we learned in the OR and apply them throughout uh, the application, I think. You know. And technology. I think we, we're still one of the techier groups, so applying technology to assist in that would be necessary. Kevin, you mentioned the Morton Society. Tell me a bit more about that. Um, it's an organization that was started um, probably about 20 years ago. Um, Ed Miller was one of the founders. Um, kind of forgetting the other two. Miller, Ed Ron, Miller, and Ron. Ron Miller, and. Anyway, they were at a uh, SAC APD meeting, the chair's organization, as, as I'm told. And the meeting was about 120 members. And at a coffee break, they were saying it's difficult to get into in-depth discussion of issues uh, in a group of 120. So they decided to form a smaller group, 15 to 20, that would meet and have time to actually discuss issues relating to the development of academic departments. And uh, I became a member in 95, I think, something like that. Um, and we uh, uh, meet at uh, the O'Hare Airport the Wednesday after uh, Labor Day for a brief meeting. And then we meet in a warm, sunny place in February. And the February meeting is three days where we have a rough agenda, uh, no slides, uh, no talks. <laughs> but discussions um, and sort of an outline agenda of discussions where everyone uh, uh, provides insight experience from their institution, 
uh, it's uh, totally open and honest and uh, uh, environment where people are free to say what the problems are in their department without worrying that will be somehow held against them, you know. So people freely discuss their, their issues of where they have difficulties in there so they can get help. And it was sort of a help each other group. Uh, and it's about 18 to 20 members. You must be a chair. You must have been a chair for uh, several years at least and have uh, some academic background of your own and have a, have a, a significant sized academic department so that you, uh, so the discussions on academic investment are, are um, uh, significant issues in your department. Kevin, you mentioned earlier marrying an OB resident mm -hmm. out in Irvine. Tell us about your wonderful wife and two sons. Well, Amy, you know, as I said, I was a second year resident, said I was a blind date, uh, which was a little risky, but it worked out great. Uh, nine months later, we were married. Um, about a year and a half after that, we had a son, Tyler. Uh, went back to Michigan and had another son, Connor. Uh, they're both grown now, grew up on a farm. We bought a farm, 160 acre homestead farm, live outside of town, eight miles of sheep and chickens. Um, kids, uh, when they're growing up, uh, milk cows on weekends, on Saturdays, dairy farm across the street. Uh, Tyler went to U of University of Michigan as a chemistry, then switched to electrical engineering and computer science. Graduated last year as a computer engineer. Uh, he's doing computer engineering uh, database research work at U of M now. Um, Connor is a math, um, actual math, business math, actual science. He's a mathematician uh, statistics major. Um, he's a junior this year, so another two years and he'll be out. Um, now Amy's a primary care obstetrician, OBGYN, has uh, worked um, from when we were married. She finished uh, residency, worked uh, pretty much half time, a little more than half time, which is pretty busy for an obstetrician, OBGYN, um, raising two kids at the same time. And has continued, works, to, uh, works at a uh, outpatient clinic, does uh, C-sections, elective sections. Stopped taking call at age 60, in-house call, but does uh, sections and minor procedures and um, she's a very busy uh, practice. You mentioned earlier your parents remodeled a barn. Yes. Lived in it when you were yes. a young man. Didn't you also have a barn? Yes. Yeah, I know when as a kid, people would say, look at those manners. You were raised in a barn? And I said, oh, <laughs> yes, I was, actually. Um, yeah, we, um, we built a house out in this alfalfa field um, and um, no barn. You know, and, and uh, if you, in the Midwest, if you drive along any dirt road, you'll come along an old barn built in the 1800s, probably every mile. Um, so we got a, a barn um, down the street, bought it for $2,500. Uh, built about 1860, handmade, beautiful structure. Uh, it was $2,500. They said they don't deliver. So I had to uh, get a house mover to move it. Took about two years to get it moved and put, put together. Um, that's got a basketball court inside, a lot of, a lot of things. And my tractor in there. Good, good. That's great. I love living out in the country. Good. Well, now, Kevin, let's talk a bit more about adding value in the operating room and how we do that using both our physician and our physician extender resources. Got any ideas? Yeah. Well, I um, coming from the West Coast in the 80s, there were relatively few CRNAs or physician extenders, CRNAs. And in coming to the Midwest, there were more. And um, now I've been working in an apartment where we've grown the number of CRNAs from 14 when I got there to well over 100 now. We could not possibly do the work without their help, without them there with us. So I, you know, the, I think the care team model uh, is the only way we can go forward. In fact, we could be, we could say that our, our model is a model for other physician extenders. In many ways, uh, uh, CRNAs are the most highly trained, specialized nurses there are. Um, if other nurses had that degree of training, they could extend many of the other uh, physician specialties uh, to the same extent. I don't see there being an excess of physicians. I think most predictions would say there's a shortage. Um, if you do the arithmetic on anesthesiologists, uh, when I started residency, we 
We graduated 800 roughly in my graduation class in the early 80s. Um, by the early 90s, we were graduating 1,800. So through the 80s, each class was 100 larger than the previous year for a decade. Um, I'm getting older. <laughs> so when I uh, retire, um, there'll be 100 more retiring each year after me for the next decade. So just by the math, there'll be 1,800 graduates from the 80s that'll be retiring or dying. So we're going to run out of, and I think we're going to get a shortage of anesthesiologists starting in about five years as, they, as that large lump of people start going through the system. At the same time, we're going to have more people to take care of. So I think um, we may need to cover larger. Maybe there are things that CRNAs are covering with us that can be done by uh, well-trained sedation nurses. And the CRNAs can be for uh, lower risk and moderate risk cases, and then the super specialty cases done by anesthesiologist uh, solo. Um, and there'll be a gradation of care. I think what Patricia Kapoor was saying that everyone will need to practice to their highest degree of training uh, just to get all the work done in a cost effective way. So I, I think that's my version of what the future will be. Well, thank you, Kevin, for sharing your inspiring story. And this interview will be placed in the Wood Library Museum archives, and it'll be used for informative viewing for many decades to come. And we're assured is going to be up and online probably within the next 12 months. And I, David Brown, and speaking for myself and Dr. Tremper, wish to thank the Wood Library Museum and its committee of the John Pender Living History of Anesthesia Series for making this interview uh, possible. We especially want to thank the committee chair, Dr. Bradley E. Smith, and the co-chairs, Marcella Willock and Dr. Frank Scammon, for their work and help. Thank you all, and we enjoyed it. Hi, this is Kevin Tremper again. The Living History Committee has asked that I provide a little more commentary and some pictures uh, from my past, so here goes. Uh, first, I'd like to do a little bit of the, my history, and then I'd like to talk about some of the things I'm proud of in the department that we've accomplished, and then finally some thank you to friends around the country. Uh, this first picture is a picture of my father during World War II during his flight training in Biloxi, Mississippi, and this next picture is when he was flying uh, the first helicopters developed in the U.S. This was a sort of a secret mission. Uh, Igor Sikorsky had invented the hel helicopter in uh, New Haven, Connecticut. He was in the Coast Guard, and here he is flying, um, taking off of an aircraft, actually, in uh, the Sound off of Connecticut. This next picture is a picture of me in Berkeley. Um, during my PhD, it's a picture of uh, the upper part of the campus, the Berkeley campus, and the lower left of the picture is the College of Chemistry, and we're looking up at Strawberry Canyon. The upper right is a picture of me in my hippie years at Berkeley. This next picture it jumps forward almost a decade um, of, a, of a fellow with uh, Will Schumacher at Harbor General Hospital, and I had a project working on the first perfluorochemical blood substitute oxygen carrying agent this was called a fluosol DA 20%, a perfluorochemical emulsion. Um, and this was the first patient that received this product as part of the study. Uh, this patient had a preoperative hematocrit of 14 and uh, did very well. Unfortunately, the product probably didn't help her that much, but the immediate surgery for her probably did. And here's me consenting her. Uh, that consent says this is very risky, about 20 times. So she's uh, not that happy to be getting it, but she's happy to be getting her surgery. These next two pictures are of myself and Jenny Mace, my secretary, when we both started our careers at UC Irvine in the early 80s. Uh, both of us young and good looking. The lower part are, as we are today, old and very good looking again. Um, Jenny and I, um, 30 years later at University of Michigan. Uh, when I was at Irvine, I was set up on a blind date with an OB resident by one of our anesthesia residents. Fortunately, it worked out. I don't know what would have happened to me if I had been caught as a department chair dating a resident in another department, but 
Nine months later, we were married, and this is Amy Christie becoming Amy Tremper. Uh, she is now a faculty in OBGYN at University of Michigan. This next picture is of Amy and I with my mentor, John Severinghouse at Irvine. This next picture also has John Severinghouse in the middle with myself and Steve Barker on either, either side. Steve was the first faculty I recruited as a new chair at Irvine, a, a fellow PhD engineer, um, was recruited from San Diego and became the associate chair and we had a very, very productive collaborative uh, research relationship and was my very good friend. Ultimately took over as chair at Irvine and is currently chair at the University of Arizona. Below is a picture of Amy and I at a holiday party here in Michigan, a little after our marriage of 24 years before. The next picture is one of our family in Kenya during an educational mission uh, two summers ago. Myself, Amy, and our two sons, Tyler and Connor. Tyler, a recent graduate, is a computer engineer from Michigan. Connor is currently a math major, math and it's actually business, math, actuarial science major. We'll be graduating next year. We had a great time in Kenya, and Jen, Amy has gone back, and uh, actually twice, uh, to this educational program in Kenya. While I'm in the mood for bragging, I'd like to brag about uh, some things in the department. This picture is of a group of assistant professors in the tenure track at Michigan who were recruited in the mid-2000s who have accelerated the department's uh, academic productivity, specifically with respect to clinical research. Uh, they are as follows, uh, upper left, Chad Brummett, George Mashore below him, Buki Nafu above me, Mike Malley to the right of him, Krish Ramachandran above Jill Meyer, and Sachin Caterpal. Not pictured here is Jim Blum, an intensivist. Each of these faculty are from different areas, with specialties within anesthesiology, and each has been very productive in moving their area of research forward. They worked extremely well collaboratively and synergistically in, in allowing the department to be uh, a leader, I feel, in uh, clinical research today. I was very fortunate and honored to be the Rovenstein Lecture in 2010. That was followed in 2011 with George Mashore receiving the Presidential Scholar Award, which was followed in 2012 with Ralph Leidick receiving the ASA Excellence in Research Award. And in December of 2013, the department will be honored with a special issue of anesthesiology highlighting its academic productivity. So this is sort of a four-year run that I, I think was something we all are very proud of at Michigan. This wouldn't be complete without a description of a couple other relationships. Um, pictured here is Sachin Cater Powell, Mike O'Reilly, and myself in one of our favorite coffee shops, Espresso Royal Cafe. Uh, the three of us, along with um, Sachin's older brother, Vic, uh, met every Saturday morning for three years from eight to 10 and developed uh, a perioperative information system that we called Michigan Operating Room Care or More Care. Mike O'Reilly kept calling it Mike O'Reilly Care, but I think it was uh, the Michigan Care, ultimately purchased by General Electric and is now marketed as, as Centricity. Uh, we had a great fun making this system, and it's working today at Michigan and throughout other places in the country. Next is a little bit of my personal entertainment history. Uh, relates to uh, my teaching of uh, cardiopulmonary physiology going back to the uh, early time as an ICU in my early years as faculty. I used to draw a picture on the board of the heart, lungs, cardiovascular system and outline the arithmetic of oxygen transport for junior faculty, junior residents and faculty. Uh, several years ago, I um, noted that since we had an information system with all the uh, information in it, the AIM system. We had a physiologic monitor with the information in it. We had a history and physical that had patients' comorbidities in it and labs with objective data. We now had all the parts of the patient's medical record that could provide a living 
representation of the cardiovascular system, including management, current management, and risk. So I drew the picture that's shown on this figure with a brain on top, heart, lungs in the middle as a schematic and asked one of the master's students at the University of Michigan's uh, computer science school if they could make a living image of this that could run live from the live data from the physiologic monitors, the AIM system, the HNP and the labs. The next picture shows a picture of that system as we have it in the OR today, we call it uh, alert watch. It's, uh, I must put a disclaimer in, it's, it's a small IP company now uh, running at the University of Michigan. Um, it provides live feedback and alerting <coughs> for a variety of uh, physiologic conditions, MAC, filling status, looking for MH, looking for possible tension in mythoraces, variety of things like that. We're testing it now. If you see it in the future, you'll know I'm retired happily somewhere in the, in the Cayman Islands. If you don't see it, then this is the last time you'll have heard of it. As I was preparing for this lecture, I noted this other picture, which I'll show now. What you're seeing now is a picture of me in the lower left in Groningen University in Utrecht, Holland in 1979. Uh, this was the first time I'd been actually asked to give a lecture out of the country. I was talking about oxygen monitoring. The person in the podium was leading a question and answer uh, session after my lecture. That's Dr. Smallhout, who's uh, famous for developing capnography, of which I had never heard of at the time. It was a new thing to me. And if you look on the, the blackboard above there and you have good vision, you'll see a picture of a heart and a lungs diagram that I was drawing during that lecture in 1979, which is the same one that I drew for the master's student four years ago and the same one that's in Alert Watch today. So I, I, I had this same picture in my mind and I just wouldn't let it go. So finally it's, it's alive and running. Hopefully it'll be of value someday. I'd like to conclude with a, with a thank you to friends and colleagues from my career over the past 20 years around the country. I have this picture of a group of chairs that met in, 19, in 2002 um, in February in Miami to celebrate and have a dinner uh, celebrating Manny Papper, who is in the center of this photo. And the people in the picture from left to right start at, with Warren Zapal on the far left, Leonard Firestone, Roberta Hines, Roger Johns, Simon Gilman looking down at his feet. He's always kind of a humble guy. Um, and behind him, Ed Lowenstein, peeking by in him is Mark Warner, and then Manny Papper in the middle with um, Margaret Wood on one side, David Longnecker above Margaret Wood, John Waller, Bill Owens, Fred Cheney, Ron Miller with me up above Ron Miller, and then Alex Evers and John Campine. Um, it was a great evening. We had a great time together. Unfortunately, he died uh, in December of that year. Final slide is a picture of the beach. This is myself, Alex Evers, Warren Zapal, and Mark Newman. We went fishing uh, off of Camas San Lucas for part of a day. We caught nothing. We had a good time. Um, these have been very good friends, especially Alex Evers, who's been a friend, uh, colleague. Um, he has been very collaborative with his department. He's got a tremendous department. And he's helped form a special relationship between George Mashore and Mike Avedan that I think is one of the best collegial relationships in our field. Uh, they have worked together on an ASA-supported study on uh, evaluating BIS for awareness. has led to a series of articles in New England Journal and others in ASA, uh, anesthesiology. Uh, but I, I think he's been just a, a real true friend and colleague and like to thank him and recognize the tremendous work of George Mashore and Mike Avedon. I'd like to close by thanking all the faculty, staff, residents, all the people at Michigan that made my career so pleasant, so much fun. Um, hopefully it's not over right now, but um, ultimately it will be. I'd like to thank them. I'd like to thank David Brown for the introduction of the, the history and Simon Gilman for getting me involved in SAC APD, where I became uh, president for a while. Thank you very much. Bye.
Thank you.